Welcome to Minimalish. I'm your host, Desiree, and this is a podcast about minimalism. Sort of. It's a podcast about how living with less stuff and less distractions can help us focus on what's most important. So what you'll find here, of course, we will talk decluttering and living with less, but we'll also talk about the important things in life and how to approach them intentionally. We'll approach topics of motherhood, home life, relationships, work, our health, and the important things in general that fill up our days. And what you won't find here, a perfectionist version of minimalism. I'm a mom, a full-time teacher, and a podcaster, and I've found the version of minimalism that you may find on Instagram or Pinterest to be unattainable. We aren't minimalism purists here. We're simply focused on living with less in a way that's realistic to us. It's a version of minimalism I personally like to call minimal-ish. The goal is not living with less for the sake of less here or to make sure our homes make us look like a minimalist. The goal is living with less in a realistic way so that we can have more time and space and energy to focus on what matters most. I'm so glad you're here. Let's dive into this week's episode. Welcome back to Minimalish. I'm your host, Desiree. Today is one of the most exciting episodes that I have ever put out. I remember sitting down years ago thinking about who my dream guests for this podcast would be. And at the top of that list was Shauna Neaquist. I really thought it was a dream and it would never happen. But the reason why I wanted to have Shauna on the show is because her books introduced me to the idea of intentional living in general. I started reading her books back in college. I've continued to read anything she has put out since. If you don't know who she is, she is a New York Times bestselling author. Her previous books are Cool Tangerines, Bittersweet, Bread and Wine, Savor, Present Over Perfect, and her newest book that is coming out in April, which is I guess I haven't learned that yet. She'll talk more about who she is as we start the interview, but her words have changed me in so many ways, changed the way that I see life, and again, introduced me to this concept of slower, intentional living that has become such a part of who I am. And today I get to release an interview that I did with her, which seems surreal. I won't gush over it anymore. Instead, I'll just give you a quick preview of what we talk about today. We are talking all about the concept of change and letting go in today's episode. If you have listened to previous episodes of mine, you know that I've made a lot of changes in my life. And one of my mantras has become, it's okay to change your mind. I have said that a lot. I did an episode about that uh, years and years ago. And since then, I have continued to live that out. The way Shauna talks about changes that maybe we don't want to make or don't expect to make today is extremely relatable, extremely grace-filled. And we also talk about what happens when we need to let go of something that maybe we're not ready to. And how do we embrace the present, embrace the next chapter We also talk about her namesake for the book, the phrase, I guess I haven't learned that yet. Shauna speaks wisdom and life with her words, just as she does in her books. So let's dive right into my conversation with Shauna. Okay, today I am absolutely honored to be interviewing Shauna Neaquist. I just told you before we started, you are my favorite nonfiction author, and I am I've read all your books. I'm loving your current books. So I'm just, I'm just so excited to have you on the podcast today. Oh, thank you for having me. This is my pleasure. The first question I always like to start off with is, in case someone listening is not familiar with you, would you mind just talking a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, I'm a writer and um, I'm a writer because I'm a reader. I'm like a 100% bookworm and books are the thing that help me, shape me, heal me, teach me. And so to get, all I wanted to to do ever was to get to be a part of that community of writers and authors and voices. And so I really love um, getting to do this work. And I am a lifelong Midwesterner. Grew up in Chicago and in Michigan. Um, And then three years ago, my husband and I and our two boys moved to New York City. And it has just been a total adventure and we've learned so much. Um, So that's, yeah, that's who I am. Yeah. And I love kind of what you document of this 
current and, you know, the past couple of years season of your life through your newest book. Like I said before, I've read and loved all of your books. Um, When I heard that you were coming out with a new book, I was so excited and I'm honored to get to read it a little bit early. And even as I was reading the intro, I was like, yes, (laughs) these are always the words that I need. This is so good. I I love the story towards the beginning of the book that you start out with. And it's part of the namesake of your book, right? How your family mantra became, I guess I haven't learned that yet. So could you talk a little bit about, I guess, the origin story of the title of this new book um, and just how this became your family mantra in general? Absolutely. So, you know, we moved from the suburbs of Chicago um, to Manhattan, and there are like a million different differences in there, right? Like there's Midwest versus Northeast, there's suburbs versus city, there's hometown with all the grandparents and the aunts and uncles, and then like completely new. So it felt like on every level, our kids especially were going through a massive change. They were seven and 12 at the time, and they started new schools mid-year. And we were noticing that they were coming home with with questions every day. Of course they were, you know, Um, it's so different. The process of living here is so different. So they were asking like, you know, why is it like this? Why can't I do this? Why am I not getting the hang of this? And then I realized there there were like, there was like a level of questions underneath those questions. Um, Am I falling behind? Um, Have I made too many mistakes? Am I dumb? And I was like, hold the phone. Okay. We need to talk about this. We need to essentially normalize what it means to be new, what it means to be a beginner, what it means to be finding things out as we go, because they were starting to feel like something was wrong with them for not knowing automatically how to do everything. But you shouldn't in a new place. No one knows in a new place. And so I got out a piece of printer paper and I put it, I, I wrote, I guess I haven't learned that yet in Sharpie. And I put it on our wall with blue tape. And I said, here's the deal. Every single day, all four of us are going to say this at least at least once a day, and we're going to tell each other about it. What's something that you learned today that you didn't know yesterday? What's something you didn't yet learn or get the hang of that you hope maybe you do tomorrow? And we tried to find lots of examples for them. Like, listen, I can't figure out how to get our laundry done. This is so weird. I can never figure out the right amount of groceries to buy because I'm used to having a car and all I have, now all I have are like tote bags. And we started to kind of build this conversation into our family where we talked about like what's what's new and what we're figuring out and how that we tried to frame it as a positive thing and not, and not a negative thing. And I hope it helped our kids. But I realized at a certain point, it was really, really helping me, not just on the level of being like the new kid in town, which I very much was, but also like you know, I was 42 when we moved. I'd been living in my hometown for a long time. I'd written a bunch of books. There was sort of, I had slid in the into the mentality of being like the person who knows, the person who has the answers, like maybe the expert. And there was something very freeing about taking off that expert identity and saying, like, what if I'm still really curious? What if I still have a lot to learn? What if I can still make a lot of mistakes and then make them right and keep going and get back up? And that ushered me into a really exciting life-giving season where I kind of got to reset a lot of those previous identities and assumptions and got to try a lot of new things. And I like it better. I like being curious better than I like being an expert. That's so good. I I always say, you know, I feel like the world with the internet and everything is full of experts, right? (laughs) There's just experts everywhere. And sometimes it feels like, well, what are, what am I the expert at? And what am I supposed to be expert at? And I, I don't feel like an expert. So what's wrong with me? So I just love that mentality of we don't have to be the expert. We can, we can be continually learning. Do you feel like that phrase has helped you like become less frustrated with yourself through a new season? Oh, absolutely. I feel like it applies in so many areas, even just like little stuff. I was traveling the last couple of weeks and I ended up in a lot of new places. And then also, you know, there's all these different documents. Like if you're traveling internationally right now, the like the COVID test has to go on the app, has to go on the this and the proof of this and this. And I just couldn't get it right. And instead of feeling frustrated with myself or like, Uh, isolated or anxious. I just like marched up to someone at the airport. I was like, hi, I don't know how to do this. I have all the papers. 
all of them. I have mil- 1 million papers. Here's my phone. I'm trying really hard. Could you just help me like with the last couple steps? And I think that's, there's two different things happening there. There's um, not getting frustrated when you don't know how to do something. And then there's also the willingness to reach out and admit you don't know something. People love to help. People who have an area of expertise, even in some small way, like, don't you love it when someone asks for help and you know how to help them? And so I am <laughs> giving that gift to so many people in my life right now, just saying like, would you help me? Because I don't, I'm not going to be able to figure this out on my own. Like you said, it's, it's easy to be afraid of asking for help, but I mean, we build up other people when we ask them for help. We maybe build community. Maybe we'd make a friend that we didn't, you know, expect to make. It's, it's huge that we can lean on each other. I hope you're enjoying today's episode, but I want to take a quick break to thank the sponsor that is making it possible. Right now, hiring is a challenge. So if hiring is a part of your job in any way, it's time for a hiring partner that can help you rise to the challenge. And that's Indeed. If you're hiring, you need Indeed because Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applicants that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Indeed partners with you on every step of the hiring process. Find great talent through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. With Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a post, you'll get a short list of quality candidates with resumes on Indeed that match your job description, and you can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for quality applications that meet your must-have requirements. One of the things I find great about Indeed are the assessments. They help quality applicants shine with over 135 assessment tests from cooking to coding. So Indeed will help you find your top talents abilities faster with these 135 assessment tests. You can start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash minimalish. Offer valid through March 31st. That's indeed.com slash minimalish. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. All right, friend, let's get back to today's episode. I want to talk about kind of the season of change that that you went through and that you talk about in your book um this idea of you know you you mentioned it before moving from the midwest to uh, new york and you know moving from suburbs to a big city and you talk about in your book how you you expected to maybe be in your hometown to be where you were for a really long time and then things changed so uh, the one word you use, disillusioned um, and disillusionment. And that definitely comes about when we have to make a change that is unexpected, that we didn't think you know we needed to make. So can you talk a little bit about your story and maybe just like what you learned through that change that maybe you were resistant to make over the past few years? You know, I think um, it's so easy to believe the myth of control, right? That we are totally the authors of our own stories, that our lives are completely within our own hands and we can kind of shape them into whatever we want. And then every once in a while, something happens and forces you to face let the fa- like that's a myth. Our lives are not entirely in our control. Other people's choices affect us, life events, global events, cultural events, you know, Um And I think that's a place that so many of us are in right now. You know, for me, a lot of those big changes and that out of control feeling happened kind of in the two or so years before the pandemic. But then we all experience that together. Wait a minute. I can't go anywhere. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The people I love maybe are at their health is at risk. Wait a minute. Like all of a sudden we all had to grapple with, I don't have control of my daily choices the way I used to. And it makes you reframe everything. It it makes you challenge a lot of your assumptions. And there's a little bit of grief, I think. I thought my life was going to go one way. And, um, you know, especially for friends of ours who had to cancel their weddings 
or had to have really small weddings or whose kids didn't get to have graduation ceremonies or who didn't get to see loved ones for a long time. There's grief in that. This is not going according to plan and we're missing out on good things. And so I think it's important for all of us to allow ourselves to feel grief, to give ourselves a little time and space and grace to say, it's hard to adjust to a reality that we didn't choose. The one thing I do find though is it gets easier as you do it. The first big unexpected change, you're like, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. Like, hold the phone. I'd like to speak to a manager. This is not what I want. As you do it over and over though, it starts, you you gain the new muscles and the new skills to deal with it with a little more grace and a little more perspective. And so if anything good has come out of this season in my life and then this season in all of our lives, it's, I think, a new kind of resilience and, and a new kind of willingness to trust in a good future, even though it's not the future I mapped out for myself. Yeah, that's such reassuring advice, I think, because we all go through it. And like you said, we've collectively all went through it the past two years, but you know, we all go through it in different ways as well. And you mentioned some advice to begin with right there, but I just want to know, you know, if someone's listening that is going through some kind of unexpected change in their life right now, you know, what is some advice that you have for someone going through any type of unexpected change in their life? Well, you know, I think the first thing is it, is to allow yourself to experience how painful it is. It is. Change is hard. Even if you choose it, even if you know it's right, even if, even if, even if it's still hard and it's okay to grieve what was, and it's okay to spend some time feeling the enormity of the loss. And then also, I think it's really important to care for yourself well along the way to assume any change, like Uh, So you mentioned being pregnant. Um, When you're pregnant, you have to care for yourself and for your baby in like a really extra way, right? You need more sleep. You need more water. You need more rest. You need more coziness. You get tired faster in terms of like physical exertion. You live in a different way when you're pregnant and you should. And I would say when you're going through a massive change, especially one that has some pain attached to it, it's almost helpful to think about going through it the same way you would if you were pregnant or if you had a newborn or if you were recovering from a long illness, tend to yourself with great care um, in really practical ways. A lot of times we spend a lot of time thinking about the change, but I would say these big changes, they happen in our brains. They also happen in like our bodies and our arms and legs and our stomachs and our hearts. So like, be really careful with bedtime. Give yourself the good, the gift of good sleep. Give yourself a lot of water. Get outside a lot. Ask for help. Connect with people who feel loving and, and like they want what's best for you. Like tend to yourself as though you're eight months pregnant because change is sort of like that. It's like, something growing and happening in your body. And a lot of times we're not good at doing that in normal life. And if you can sort of trick yourself into doing it through these seasons of change by thinking of it as caring for a baby or or something outside yourself, um, sometimes we care for ourselves better that way. But I think um, Aaron and I talk sometimes about this idea of being like a computer with all these different tabs open. And when you're going through a season of great change, um, you've got like 1 million tabs open all the time. It's like the energy, your battery is just like draining so fast. And so you have to tend well to yourself in physical, spiritual, emotional ways. So even if it's a fun change, even if it's one you choose, it has a lot of wear and tear on your whole self. And so to acknowledge that and care for yourself in a really kind of gentle, loving way, I think that's the best way through. Well, I can definitely resonate with that metaphor (laughs) of taking care of yourself, you know, as if you are pregnant. So as we make big changes in our life, as we make these shifts, you know, the kind that that might feel very emotional that we might be experiencing, you know, mourning from, do you have any tips on just like letting go of what once was, letting go of the old? And, you know, your book talks about finding new ways of living when it's no longer serving us, when these old things are no longer serving us, or just maybe like no longer even a part of our lives, even if we would wish they were, um, how do we let go and embrace what's ahead? 
well, there are, there are two different images. It, I wouldn't say there's any like one right answer, but there are two images that are really helpful for me. First, one of them is um, I have always been like a summer person. Like if you ask me what my favorite season is, it's summer. And I also, I know this is very controversial. I have historically, I do not like fall. I don't like it. I don't get excited about it. People go crazy for it. They're like, oh, pumpkin spice, boots, turtlenecks. I'm like, I don't like it. I want to stay in my flip-flops. I want to stay at the beach. I want berries and corn on the cob. Um, And it's mostly just like, I just really like summertime, but also they're part of the reason that I don't like fall is because it takes away my summertime. Right. And then um, I started, I don't know why I started thinking about it on like a little bit of a deeper level. And I thought, wait a minute, it's okay to prefer one season over another, but something's happening in autumn that I think might be something I'm uncomfortable with in my life, right? Things die. Things die in order for there to be a quiet, fallow winter season in order for new life to spring, to come again in spring. And I think I'm really bad at that. I think I like the full blaze, the full sunshine, the full life upon life of summertime. And I'm really bad at letting things die. And so, Um, I've been kind of holding to the phrase, let dead things die. When it's autumn, accept the reality of the autumn of different things in your life, the autumn of a friendship, the autumn of a job, the autumn of a season living in a particular town. I'm sort of the one that's like, no, 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 it's still August. It's not. It is full November and you need to let this go or I need to let this go. So I picture like that's the way the world works. That's the way nature works. And I'm the one dragging my feet, hoping for eternal summer, but that's not how it works. And if I don't allow for autumn in my life, then I don't get the stillness of winter and I don't get the new life of spring. So you have to participate in all of it. Um, And I wouldn't say I do it well all the time, but when I think about it as a beautiful cycle, as opposed to like, how dare this happen to me? That helps me a little bit. The other phrase is that I ran across recently that really helps me is, and I think it's, um, it's like a Zen proverb and it's let go or be dragged. And I heard that for the first time and I like felt it in my soul because I have been unwilling to let go. And what that meant, meant is I was signing myself up for being dragged. Um, I, I'm a classic overstayer. I'm very loyal. I want, thi- I want the things I love to last forever. I want relationships to stay the same forever. I wanted to stay in the same hometown forever. But I had a choice and it was either let go or be dragged. Um, when I first learned to water ski, and I wrote about this in the book, um, my dad said to me, you know, the rope's going to want to pull you forward and the rope's going to want to pull out of your hands. Whatever you do, don't let go. Don't let go of the rope, but totally, totally. I got it. I'm like six. Um, So the rope pulls, it pulls me up. It pulls me over. I am now face down in the water, arms out in front of me, entire body being dragged in the water. And I just am hanging on because he said, don't let go. Right. So I I don't let go. I don't go. Finally, they like slow the boat down. and They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, you said, don't let go. They were like, that's categorically not what we meant. But um That's my personality. And so um, it has taken me a long time to learn that it's okay to let go. It's okay to love something and value it and treasure it and let it go. It's okay for a season to be amazing and to still have another season come afterward. Um, That's not natural to me, but I'm learning it. And I think it's important to talk about it because a lot of us want to hang on to life as it was, as it used to be. It's impossible. And there is a life right now that we're being invited into right now. And I don't want to miss out on this because I'm hung up on that. Yeah, that's so good. Um, I love the image of the the water skiing because I think, you know, so many of us can relate to that of just wanting to hold on for dear life to whatever seems seemed good in the past. um, But then we don't we don't get to really live in the present. I have two questions that I ask every guest at the end of each episode, but before we get there, let everyone know kind of when your book comes out, uh, when they can get their copy of it and hear, hear more about all of this. Sure. It, um, it comes out on April 12th. Um, and you can get it anywhere. It'll be at big stores, online stores, little stores, independent stores. Um, you can find out more about me at Instagram. That's where, um, if I'm online or on social media, that's the place where I focus most. Um, but yeah, April 12th everywhere. 
Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So my two questions, they're kind of just for fun. Uh, what is one way that you choose intention in your everyday life? Hmm, that's a good question. What's one way that I choose intention in my everyday life? Well, I would say there are a handful of things that I try to do every single day. So a friend of mine um, was doing sort of like a life planning, life coaching thing, and I was helping him with this project. And he said, I want you to think about your to-do list uh, for the day in a totally different way. There are tasks and those are things that like, you know, they should get done or whatever, but there are bigger things that if you got to the end of the day, if you were laying in bed at night and you didn't do those things, you would feel a sense of regret. Like you were outside of your values. Like you didn't do the things that matter most to you. And so for him, um, he was newly married at the time. And so it, it was like, connect with my wife. Like I could get a truckload of tasks done or not done, but if I didn't connect in a meaningful way with my partner, I didn't do a good job being who I want to be today. And so I would say, you know, I am married and I have two boys and they're um, 10 and 15. And if I don't have a, at least a meaningful moment of connection with each one, um, that's not who I want to be uh, in the course of a day. And so sometimes that means like getting up out of bed and being like, oh my gosh, I feel like I didn't even see you today. Can you give me like two more minutes before bedtime? Um, but a meaningful connection with each of them really matters to me. Um, I try to get outside every day, which is in some ways pretty easy living in a city. I'll just make sure to get even just walk around the block a couple of times or go on one quick errand. Being outside, having some fresh air feels really like, like a good reset for my mind and my body. Um, and then I write every single day. Uh, I write and I read every single day. And I don't like write an essay. It's not always stuff someone's going to see. But um, the practice of writing is one of the kind of most important, like, this is who I am in the world. It's my way of processing everything in life. And then reading is kind of my truest love. I don't, I don't ever have a day go by that I don't read at least a couple pages. So I always connect with my three people. I get outside, I read, and I write. Yeah, that's good. The, people, the things that make us who we are are often more important than, you know, that long list of that we think we have to do to, to be a good person. But, but really those, those tasks can just build up and make a life that's not very meaningful if that's all we're focused on. My second question is really just for fun. And that is, uh, what's something that you're loving right now? Well, probably everyone's talking about this, but um, we are super into Wordle. Do you play Wordle in the mornings? I don't play it actually. And I, I still really don't even know what it is. Every time I see like people posting it, I'm like, I need to figure out what this is. <laughs> it's, it's really fun. It's really easy and it's really fun. And you know, the genius of it is that you can only play once a day and everyone's playing the same word, but it's so like, I have a, cu a couple like little word games on my phone that, you know, I can just play whenever I want, but there's something about you can only play it once until the next morning and that we're all trying to figure out the same game. It's really like kind of addictive and fun. And I just, I really like it. I will tell you one other thing. So I just went away with um, a bunch of old friends for the weekend. And one of the things we did is we just texted each other constantly with different products that we like love and have changed our lives. Like whatever you do, you have to get this. And uh, we eat a lot of pizza at our house, like a lot. And we have a pizza cutter that's scissors and it has like a flat edge on the bottom. Game changer. I love it so much. So the, the pizza slicer scooper thing is one of my favorite, favorite gadgets. Okay. I'm going to have to look into that because my pizza, my normal pizza cutter is like on its fringes. So <laughs> that sounds this is a good one. This is, this is going to change your pizza life. You're going to love it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Shauna. I, this has been an honor and I just want to say thank you for, thank you for your new book and the life-giving words that you spoke today and the life-giving words that you put out into the world your books. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Often I like to end each episode with a challenge or a takeaway that we can, you know, take something from the episode and put it into practice. Today, at least the biggest takeaway for me, which there were so many, but <laughs> it was this phrase of, I guess I haven't learned that yet. And that's the title of Shauna's book, I love that her book centers around this idea. This phrase is really impactful because I think we get frustrated with ourselves when we can't figure things out or when we 
can't get a new routine set like we'd like to. We can't keep up with our homes like we'd like to. We can't get something right at work like we'd like to or get something right in parenting. This phrase changes how rough we are on ourselves when we think of ourselves as learners, when we think of ourselves as someone who is going through this life not as an expert, not expected to be an expert, but as someone who is just learning and doing our best. So is there an area of your life right now where you've been frustrated and you've been feeling like, I can't do this. I can't get this. Why am I not already doing this right? Why am I not an expert at this? And maybe you beat yourself up about it. The first thing that comes to mind with mine is meal planning because in different seasons, it just always gets me. It's like the one thing, the first thing that falls to the wayside. Meal planning, grocery shopping, plus with changing grocery prices, it's all a mess. (laughs) And I get down on myself for this. I get frustrated when I realize I don't have dinner planned for tonight or I didn't meal plan this week and what am I doing? And now I'm on Instacart again ordering more groceries. If I didn't beat myself up so much about that, maybe I would be able to look at it as a learning experience and get a little bit better every day because I'm not just spending all my energy being angry at myself about it, right? Instead, you know, I haven't learned that yet, but I'm going to figure it out. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm going to get closer to doing a little bit better. You know, I'm going to take the first right step in getting this thing that is important to me. That is just, you know, a takeaway of mine. This phrase, I guess I haven't learned that yet, as I've been reading through Shauna's book. So what in your life are you beating yourself up about? How can you shift your mindset to more of a learning mindset in this particular area of your life? Thank you so much for being here, for listening in. If you enjoyed the episode, share it with a friend, share it on Instagram or any social media platform that you like to share on. I am super grateful for that, for just inviting new people in to listen into the show and then another thing that helps do that is just to leave a quick rating and review on the podcast if it is a show that you enjoy and that just helps get more ears on the podcast because it helps others see the podcast when it has more reviews that's just how the algorithm works so thank you so much for that for your help for your support and Just overall, thank you for listening in. I'm so glad that you are here and I hope to talk to you right back here on the next episode.